So this will be an update to a biological control project that we just started this summer and it's funded by the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. And these are some swallowwort infestations here in Michigan uh, that are either very hard to control chemically or they have been given up on, so they are not trying to control them. You see everything down here that's green, it's swallowwort and it's the whole understory of this forest patch essentially. Again, this is everything that you see green. It's a, you know, it's a vine, so it just uh, climbs up trees and whatnot. That's all swallowwort. Again, these are all infestations from this general area. Most of the infestations are here in Oakland County and Ori Orion country counties. So the two swallowwort species I'm talking about is black and pale swallowwort, uh, which are easily distinguishable by the flower they bear. And they start bearing flower relatively early, so you can tell them apart early if you want to, like already late June and early July. So the black swallowwort has darker flowers and the pale swallowwort has a pinkish flower. And the biological con uh, control program was started in 2001. It was initiated by the University of Rhode Island because uh, the easter we uh, go in the United States, the bigger the problem it is. And uh, for the biocontrol program, what you do is you go back to the native range of an invasive species and you try to find natural enemies in that range. And in that case, the native range is along the Mediterranean, uh, the Ukraine and Russia. And they found a few natural enemies, but uh, only one moth, Hypena opulenta, was found to be host specific enough to go forward with testing. And uh, it seems to be a very uh, safe agent because it was tested against 82 species that are either native to the US or economically important, but it can only develop on Vincetoxicum species, which is the genus of swallowbirds. So there is no danger of this moth ever moving on to native species. It was petitioned for field release in 2011 and finally approved in 2017 in the US. So this is the moth and in Canada it was already released in 2013 and then further releases took place in 2014. So it is the larva stage that we are interested in. It goes through five larval instars and all of them feed on the foliage of ragwort. Oh, no, that was a different project, sorry, swallowwort. And uh, here you see the feeding. It can strip the plants, like skeletonize them. The smaller larvae will just make holes in the leaves. So these are the typical feeding marks you would see if the agent is established. A single female can lay 400 eggs, so it can be a very prolific agent. And they can also complete two generations a year. So hopefully this continuous feeding pressure would uh, cause some damage to these plants. And uh, these are pictures from the lab rearing. And these are the smaller larvae. These are like second, third instar larvae. And they were feeding on the seed pods. And again, you see the smaller larvae doesn't create those big holes, but they just, you know, uh, just uh, strip the leaves of the green material. So I started by hiring a Master of Science student, uh, Brianna Aldred. So she, the work that I'm showing you today, mostly done by her. So what we have to do is first rear the agent in the lab. To do that, we have to grow hundreds of swallowbird plants, which I know sounds a little crazy, but we actually try to keep them alive in the greenhouse, which is harder than keeping them alive in the field. Anyways, uh, that just happens always with invasive species. So we went into the winter really good. We thought we were very well equipped because we had 2,000 pupa from our last year's rearing, but there were a few uh, like problems during the winter. One of the ma incubators, we kept them malfunctioned and overheated, so it killed some of them. Essentially what happened is that we only got less than 200 adults of the 2,000 overwintering pupa, so we had less than 10% emergence rate, but at least we got some. So we could start some experiments. The other problem was that those adults that emerged laid fewer eggs than we were expecting them. They supposed to lay up to 400 eggs. They were not producing nearly as much. And then we were also hit by a microsporidia infection, which is a protozoa that like liquefies the gut of the caterpillars, so kills them. And again, that's just a generalist species, so it can attack lots of different uh, uh, caterpillars and not much we could do about it. So we ended the season with two, 220 pupa to overwinter 
as opposed to the 2000 last year. But we are hoping we will be much better at keeping these alive over the winter. At least we have some precautions already installed in the incubators and whatnot. So again, go, like planning for next year, we already talked to the University of Rhode Island. They were the one initiating the biocontrol program. They have the biggest colony right now. So we requested pupa from them to start early next year. And we are also making an artificial diet, which includes grinding uh, dr uh, gr like dried uh, swallowbird leaves into some general diet to try to rear. So to get a head start on the season, we will start to rear them early in the season, hopefully to build up numbers for next summer. And uh, these are some of the experiments that we conducted this year. So first of all, we wanted to figure out that what kind of densities you need to reach to kill the plants or to cause significant fitness redu reduction of the swallowbird plants. And to do that, uh, what we usually do is you have to set up a common garden. So by a common garden, I mean that you transplant plants into a common environment. In that case, it's the MSU entomology farm. The reason we do that is because if we were just to release them in the field, there will be different densities of swallowbird infestations. There will be microclimatic differences in the field. So there will be so many variables that you cannot tell that it's the actual density that's causing damage to the plants or it's some other factors. So with these common garden experiments, we try to remove the environmental variable. So it's, we are assuming that, so we are transplanting the same density of plants into each plot. And then we are releasing different densities of insects, but the environment of the plots is relatively, like across the plots, is almost the same. And again, the question we are asking here is that what larvae densities we need to reach per stem to kill plants or to severely weaken them. And then in a different experiment, we are testing how well the moth is synchronized with the climate in Michigan. So in Canada, what they found is that if they release them before the summer solstice, which is around June 23, they got two generations. But if they release them after the summer solstice, they only produced one generation. And we are a little more south than Canada, so we are trying to figure out what our release dates should be to get two generations for sure. And so to do that, uh, so that's the impact experiment and what we did, these are 18 plots and we covered each plot with these tents. And so in each plot we transplanted 40 black swallowbird plants and then we released these different densities. We had the control where we didn't release any moths, so we just uh, measured the plant fitness in those. And then we released either one pair, two or five pairs of moths. And again, they seem low, but you only have 40 plants and then a pair can produce 400 you know, uh, eggs. So we were hoping for lots of damage. And then each of these treatments were repeated four times. So we had 16 plots and then we used two plots where we just tested whether the cages had any effect because they were shading the plants and you know, that could already inf impact the plant fitness. And this is what the plants looked like in one of the plots. So that's what about 40 stems look like when they go up on a potato or a tomato uh, screen. And this is Brianna doing the releases. So we managed to release adults here uh, before the summer solstice. So they we released them in 20, uh, on the 28th of June, but they emerged seven to 10 days before that. We just wanted to make sure that they laid the eggs before we released them. So we kept them in the lab and monitored whether they started laying eggs. And when they started laying eggs, that when, that's when we took them out. And this is the data that was collected in those plots. So 10 stems were chosen randomly. And on those 10, stem, uh, 10 stems, uh, Brianna was counting the number of leaves. And then she also estimated how many leaves or counted how many leaves were, had chewing marks that are very like particular to this moth. And then what was the damage over all the leaves that was caused by the moth. And then how many larvae per stem she found. And then the stem, stem height was measured three times during the season. All the other data was taken like either weekly or later in the season bi-weekly. And then she also counted the number of stems at the beginning, at the end of the season, and at the end, how many seed pods were uh, produced. And the good news is, we f so this is the frost. So that's the poop of the caterpillars. And these are the feeding marks. So 
and this is one of the caterpillars in one of those plots. So that was great news that we started seeing some development. The bad news was this fungus. I don't know how visible it is, but this black fungus and the white, so it's a Cercospora leaf spot. And I don't know if you remember, but the spring here was very cold and wet. And we think that's what has caused this uh, infestation. It was really bad. So look at this leaf. This is, I mean, that's what they're supposed to feed on. And in some of the plots, 80% of the leaves on the plants were infected by this fungus. We got to the point of actually spraying a fungicide to keep the plants alive. <laughs> And so that's, in, yeah, that's what we were just talking about with Rick, that what you do for science, you spray a, spray a fun. We talked to Rhode Island and they found that same uh, fungus last year and it actually killed their plants. So we were just worried that the experiment would go down if we didn't save them. So the good news is that we had second generation adults emerging. So at least we could confirm that these uh, moths can complete two generations in Michigan. So this moth is inside the cage, as you can see from the picture. So we consider it great news given, of, uh, given the fungi infection. The other great news is this is one of our plots, and I don't know again how visible it is, but these leaves are all stripped. Unfortunately, they left all the, uh, leaf, uh, the pods, but the leaves were completely stripped. So this is one of the cages where we released five pairs of adults, and they just ate everything that was available. So again, that's good news. We know swallowwort can regenerate after uh, you know, foliage is destroyed, but we don't know if they keep up this damage, how much longer they can compensate for that. So again, we consider that good news. So again, just the take home from that experiment is that uh, this moth can complete two generations in Michigan and we could achieve complete defoliation despite the fungus. But we still think the fungus had a negative effect, effect on the moths. And uh, the, uh, the bad news is that we only saw adults in three of the plots out of the 12 where we released them. So in nine plots, we didn't really see establishment, or at least we didn't see a second generation being produced. So again, that's a question we can answer next year when we keep monitoring those plots, whether something will emerge or not. If something emerges, it means they just produced one generation. If nothing emerges, it means they didn't establish. And this is the other experiment. So we call it the synchronization experiment, where we are looking at uh, how well they are synchronized with the Michigan climate. And for that, we use the natural black swallowwort infestation that's on campus. And we just put cages over plants. So these are uh, one square meter cages or cubic meter cages. And that's like about how many plants they cover. And uh, we released uh, insects at four different dates. So, you know, these, again, this is around the summer solstice, and then like in every two weeks, essentially, or as we had adults like available in the lab. We only released one pair of uh, moths per plot. Again, assuming they lay 400 eggs, and we always made sure that the females we released already laid eggs, we thought that would be enough to uh, ensure establishment in a protected environment. And we collected the same data as for the impact experiment. The bad news is that we didn't see any adult emergence. We saw some larva feeding at the beginning, but then it just tapered off and we didn't see much. These plots were affected by the fungus as well. So these were not like, these were natural uh, infestations and you know, we didn't like, yeah, it's just uh, all the natural infestations I went to around Oakland County were affected by the fungus uh, to a certain extent. Anyways, uh, so this experiment may have been unsuccessful. Again, we will keep monitoring it next year, but we are also planning to repeat it uh, with a different setup. And that, uh, so since we uh, didn't have much success of like uh, getting a big colony of insects to start big experiments, we were thinking of other ways we could test it. And one of the things about swallowers is that they are an ecological trap for monarchs because monarchs choose to lay eggs on them because they are closely related to milkweeds, but then all the monarch larvae dies. And the question we were asking, and this is actually a picture I took of a monarch sitting, this is a swallowwort, and uh, I saw several monarchs like favoring swallowwort in, uh, in a landscape. So the hypothesis here is that maybe if we release a moth 
which is a caterpillar feeding similarly as the milkweed caterpillar on the swallowbird plants, that would discourage monarchs from laying eggs on swallowbirds. And so we wanted to test this idea uh, using first a field experiment. And what we did here is we had potted milkweed plants and then swallowbird plants where we released, so the biocontrol agent was feeding on the plant for two weeks before we put it out. And then swallowbird plants that was like just clean, like it didn't, didn't have a biocontrol agent feeding. And again, our hypothesis is that the uh, monarchs would lay eggs on milkweed, but they wouldn't lay eggs on this one because the caterpillar is there but they may lay eggs again on swallowbird where there is no other competing species. So we replicated this experiment over six sites and it was just on MSU campus, just using natural areas where monarchs just flapping around in the wild. So we just essentially expected those monarchs to lay eggs on our plants. And we counted the eggs on each of the leaves uh, daily and then removed them. And we did that over two weeks. Again, the data is not analyzed for this one, but there doesn't appear to be any difference between how many eggs they lay on swallowbird with hypena or without hypena. But again, we, we didn't have enough eggs on milkweed, I think, to make the uh, comparison well. So we will again expand on this experiment next year using uh, like uh, caged uh, monarchs instead of just uh, uh, relying on the naturally uh, occurring monarch population. But the bad news is that they, stu they lay eggs on swallowbird. And not a many, but they did lay some eggs on swallowbird. We repeated the same experiment in the lab. And for that, we used the lab colony, that uh, lab colony of monarchs that was used for other experiments before. And so they only experienced milkweed and no natural conditions. And we were curious how they would respond to these similar treatments. So we put monarchs in cages where we offered them either milkweed only, so they didn't have a choice. Uh, we just, this is just to establish how many eggs they lay on milkweed. And then there was a treatment where we only put swallowbird plants in. So again, they didn't have a choice. They, if they wanted to lay eggs on swallowbird, they either did or did not. And then, we had two choice, exper uh, two, two choice treatments where we give them the choice to either lay eggs on milkweed or swallowbird again infested with the biocontrol agent or milkweed and swallowbird but not infested with the biocontrol agent. And here, not a single eggs were laid on swallowbirds, regardless if the biocontrol agent was present or not. And we think uh, it can be an artifact that these monarchs were never like released in nature. They were always just kept being reared uh, in, on milkweeds in the lab. And again, we will repeat these experiments uh, using like captured monarchs from the field. And uh, the other thing I was working on last year is to uh, find field sites for field releases uh, of these biocontrol agents. And uh, there have been 18 field sites identified so far. And the problem is that there are more infestations, but they are too close to each other. So this area here is very dense, and I'm already lowering my criteria for choosing infestations. My uh, original criteria was that I wanted sites that were at least five kilometers apart. And now I'm one kilometer <laughs> apart, because unfortunately, I'm not unfortunately, but it's just uh, very concentrated where swallowbird occurs. So there is a lot of them here, lots of them here, and few of them here. So anyways, I have 18 sites identified. If you know of more sites, uh, I'm especially interested in this area because these few sites are really extensive. And it just seems weird that there is nothing around them, or at least uh, not that I know of. So I, I wonder if there were more infestations in the area. But again, I'm using the missing points and I'm talking to people. But again, if you know more infestations that you think would be good for uh, biocontrol releases. So these would be, again, infestations that you don't plan to treat chemically in the next couple of years. Uh, yeah. And I'm happy to share this map with people and all the coordinates as well. I'm in the process of contacting uh, landowners. So lots of the sites are in the Oakland County parks. And uh, so obviously there is permission there. But the other places like local like landowners that don't have the money or don't even know that they have an invasive species on their property. And so, I mean, 10 of these sites are actually, I have to contact people to ask permission to use their land. And 
Okay, so just a summary for this season. We know that uh, Hypena can complete two generations. If we release them around the summer solstice, uh, we will refine those measurements hopefully next year. And we started these three experiments that I uh, talked to you about. Uh, we will continue the impact experiment next year, uh, see if, uh, like, how many cages will produce adults. And then we will repeat the synchronization experiment and also continue the old one that we started. And we are hoping to collect more data in the field and experimentally whether uh, monarchs will lay eggs on swallowers or not. And the plan is to get a lot more adults next year. So hopefully the lab rearing will go well and we won't be hit by disease and fungus and all those other things that we were hit this year. And that was the update on the Swallowbird project.